What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekoArt video. In this video, we're going to be building an awesome $900 gaming PC build for 2022. I'll be running you through all the parts I selected and why, how to put the system together step by step from start to finish, before looking at detailed performance benchmarks later on, so you guys can get a detailed idea of just how well this system performs. Let's do this. Let's kick things off by looking at the CPU, motherboard and CPU cooler to begin with. You might have noticed that we've gone for an Intel platform in this build and there's a few good reasons for that. The latest 12th gen lineup I think is more upgradable and future proofed uh, than AMD's 5000 series and it performs much better. We are expecting new chips from AMD later this year but for now the Intel 12th gen offerings are a clear choice. I'll be building today's system around the Gigabyte B660 DS3H AX. Now we've done a detailed review of this motherboard but I'll give you a quick swizz as to what makes it a solid choice. Along for support of course for our 12th gen Intel CPUs, you've got 4 RAM DIMMs with RAM overclocking, you've got the latest PCIe Gen 4 for your M.2 SSDs and a decent rear I.O. that includes USB 3.1 Gen 2 10 gigabit, basically super fast USB-C and A ports and of course Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is a major plus for anyone building their first system as it means you haven't got to run a long ethernet cable around to actually get any internet. Now into the motherboard I'll be installing our i5 processor, the 12400F. Now picking a processor is actually not too difficult. On the Intel side of things you want the 12400F because it has no graphics, something we don't need anyway saving us money, decent clock speeds with plenty of cores a nice amount of threads and of course a great price point. I'd recommend this CPU be used up to a 3060 Ti but any further you'll want the 12600K or one of the Intel i7 SKUs. Pull up the retention arm on your CPU socket and the socket will actually unfold a little something like so. Drop the processor in nice and gently, you can give it a bit of a wiggle to make sure it's positioned okay but nothing too firm. Push the socket cover down, your black plastic will fall away and then we can return the arm down back into place. While we're here, we're also going to take a look at the CPU cooler for this system. I've picked up the Cooler Master Hyper 212 RGB Black Edition. Now, for some people, an aftermarket cooler, rather than the one that comes included with your processor, is a must. They're much quieter, they run your CPU cooler, theoretically extending its lifespan, and are just a nice quality of life upgrade. For $30 or $35, you can't go too far wrong, but if you want to save that cash, a stock cooler will also work as we won't be doing any CPU overclocking today, for two reasons. The motherboard doesn't support it, and neither does the CPU. I'm going to unbox our Hyper 212 and lay it all out on the table, and then I'll walk you through just how you go about installing it, as aftermarket coolers can be quite tricky. This cooler is comprised of a few key elements. The first is your backplate, which will slot through the rear of the motherboard in a moment. You've then got these optional brackets for Intel, or the ones that come pre-installed on the cooler for AMD. You'll notice the AMD ones are longer, the Intel ones are shorter and a bit chubbier. You've then also over here got these female to female screws. And we're gonna pop these on top of the backplate and actually use these to install the cooler in a moment. If we pick the motherboard up, you can go ahead and notice four holes that go directly through the PCB around the CPU. These are the holes that we need our backplate to install into. And we can do a quick cursory check as to whether it actually fits. Now at the moment, that is not looking like it's lining up whatsoever. So what we need to do is we need to take our back plate uh, and we need to just push some of these pins out very slightly to give us that little bit more room to actually install it into the rear of the board. With a bit of luck, that change now should allow us to actually go ahead and install the back plate. It has indeed. And through the motherboard, you'll now notice, if I get you a nice angle on that, some nice silver posts around the CPU itself. Lay your motherboard back onto its motherboard box for this stage, as that will make everything a bit easier. And movie hardware, 
out of the way. Position your motherboard into the middle and then take those female to female posts we referred to just a matter of moments ago. You want to slot these on top of each of the screws on each corner. Uh, you can do this in any order, it won't make any difference. And then we can finally go ahead and fasten the cooler into place. Before that though, we need to make sure these brackets installed on the cooler actually fit to the female to female screws. And by the looks of things, they most definitely do not, which is where these come in. These are our replacement brackets. Unscrew the ones that come pre-installed, add these ones on instead with the same screw that we're gonna remove from the bottom, and then we can add the cooler into place. You'll notice as well, we've added a drop of thermal paste to create that nice thermal bond between the motherboard and cooler. And this comes included uh, with the Hyper 212. So don't worry, you haven't got to go ahead and buy anything at aftermarket on your own. Once the cooler is now successfully installed, we can go ahead and look at the RAM or the memory next up. Now this is a 16 gigabyte kit of Corsair's Vengeance RGB Pro. 3600 megahertz is a great speed for our Intel CPUs. Anything higher is just surplus to requirements and will mean you need a more expensive motherboard to actually operate it. This is of course a DDR4 motherboard, not a DDR5 design. Personally at the moment, for any build less than about two and a half thousand dollars, DDR4 is where I would go. But we've talked more about this in some DDR5 content we've made over on geekawatt.com. Now to install the RAM or the memory, you want to go ahead and locate your gray notches. That's these two just about here, the second and fourth, and then line the notch on the dim slot with the notch on the uh, dim itself. Line the memory up, pop it into place and apply even pressure to both sides. You should then get a satisfying click sound once the RAM has installed and for want of a better word, jobs are good un. That's not quite it though because we need to actually finish things off on the motherboard by installing the SSD. This is a Samsung SSD 980. Not the pro, not the expensive Gen 4 drive, but they're great mid-range option. With speeds in the region of about three and a half gigabytes a second, it's a fantastic choice and honestly a perfect match for the kind of build we're looking to assemble today. Now for this stage of the process you will need a slightly special tool known colloquially on the GeekWatch channel as a teeny tiny screwdriver. There. This motherboard is a bit more bare bones, so there's no heat sinks, but our drive does run fairly cool as a Gen 3 option that doesn't cost too much money. We're going to go ahead and unscrew the M.2 screw on the motherboard slot. Once we've gone ahead and done that, we're going to keep this super safe because we'll be using this in literally 10 seconds time. Grab the drive itself and position this into your slot at sort of a 45 degree angle. Slide it into place and push the drive down. We're then going to screw it in to make sure that it doesn't go anywhere, keep it nice and secure, and that will provide data and power. Perfect to get the system going straight away. With this in the bag, we can finally then move on to the case for this system, which looks absolutely huge, but I promise you it's not. This is the Cooler Master Half 500. I'm gonna go ahead and unbox it, probably very unceremoniously, and rejoin you in a moment when it's out of the box and we can look at it properly. This case is part of Cooler Master's Half lineup. Their famous half branding gives you loads and loads of airflow uh, down the front here with two large 200 mil fans. You got loads of airflow at the top with dust filters, a decent IO with USB 3 and USB C, Gen 2 10 gigabit, nice. Uh, if we look inside the case, it's quite heavy actually. You've got a full tempered glass side panel and there's then another fan uh, just here to point more air towards your GPU. For any system I recommend you strip down the case, take off both the side panels and then we're going to lay it flat on the table to go ahead and install the motherboard which is the next stage of the build. In order to actually screw the motherboard in you need to go ahead and take the motherboard and find all of the standoff holes. These are the three holes at the top, three along the middle and three across the bottom. Now these need to match up with the corresponding standoffs that are pre-installed into the case. So let's have a check. Three at the top, three across the middle and three down the bottom. If there's any extra standoffs here, here, here or basically anywhere where the motherboard doesn't have a hole that is a problem and it needs removing or moving before you actually install the motherboard. Once you've done that, click your rear I.O. shield in and slide the motherboard into place. Line it up over each of those holes and then we can screw it down with the included screws the Half 500 kindly provides. You should be screwing through into nine standoffs, no less or no more, and that will hold your motherboard firmly into place and stop it from going anywhere. Now the good news is, we've only got two more major steps to complete in this build before we boot it up and actually play some games on it. And now those two steps are your graphics card and your power supply. Let's look at the GPU now and then round off with the power supply and all of our cables and wiring afterwards. Picking the perfect GPU in the current climate is actually a lot easier than it was six months ago. And for this build, I've opted for the 6650 XT, what I feel may become a bit of a controversial choice. Now this plugs a gap between the 3060 and 3060 Ti and actually makes a lot of sense 
because it can be found for near enough MSRP, whereas Nvidia's 3060 Ti most definitely cannot. The 3060 Ti is undoubtedly a better card, but because it's selling for such a higher price, it's not really that fair to compare these. This still beats out the 3060, a card which is at a similar price and has plenty of VRAM, unlike some of AMD's other recent GPU launches that we won't go any further into. Now this particular card, oh, whoa, that was dramatic. This particular card is the Asus Dual Design, making it a great value option. It's not the Strix card with loads and loads of RGB. It's the one you can actually find for near enough MSRP. Now if you look at the card, you've got two large fans, a decent heatsink, 8-pin power connector, fully metal backplate. It does feel a bit more flimsy than some of their more expensive, I'm just hitting everything today. They're more expensive offerings, but it's going to work fantastically well in our build. Pull your case a little bit closer and rotate it around and then you want to hover the GPU over the PCI slot at the top of the motherboard. Now looking today, it actually looks like we've taken off the right slots already. We used this case in a previous build, which you can check out in the cards, and in that we had to remove the second and third covers. In your build, you're gonna to wanna to do the same. Take off the second and third, push back the clip on the PCI slot, then slide the card into place. Apply some pressure, and it will click in nice and easily. And we can then position this nice Cooler Master Sickle Flow fan to blow even more air and keep the 6650 XT nice and cool. Screw your graphics card in, and while we're here, we can also add on our CPU cooler fan uh, for the aesthetic of this build to really start coming together. And then once the card's in, we can look at the power supply. Hold tight, because we will be looking at detailed GPU benchmarks shortly, if you're wondering, James, but how well does it perform? We're gonna get to that. Now, the power supply I've selected is this nice Corsair CX650F with 650 watts of 80 plus bronze certified power power, RGB and a fully modular interface, it's a great choice for this build. You can install it with a fan up or down orientation, but doing so would mean removing this shield, which I don't want to do. There's plenty of clearance underneath the case, so we're going to go for a fan down layout this time. Plug in all of your modular cables to the power supply, that's to your motherboard, GPU, CPU and a SATA connection and then screw the unit into the rear of the case. Once it's in, I can then walk you through all the cables and the wires you need to install. Let's start off with the power cables and round things off with the front panel connections shortly afterwards. Now for power, we've obviously got CPU power, which goes to the top left-hand corner of the motherboard. It's a four plus four pin connector, so eight pins that splits directly in half. For the GPU, we've then got a six plus two pin connection, so it's an eight pin connection that splits into six or two. Beware of mixing this up with the CPU connection as they're very different and they don't work with one another. We can then also install our motherboard power cable to the motherboard like so. It's the largest connection of the bunch with 12 pins across two columns. So 24 pins in total. We're also going to pop in a SATA power cable to the rear of the motherboard uh, for actually powering the RGB fan hub at the front and the rear of the case before moving on to the front panel cables. That's all the wires and connections that make the IO at the top of the case actually work. This includes USB 3, the largest front panel connection, which is notched. You've then also got your USB-C, which is a bit more bulky than USB 3. It's less movable, but is a smaller rectangular connection uh, with no pins. Great to see. We've also got HD audio, which powers up the headphone mic combo jack and goes to the bottom left of the motherboard. And our front panel, JFP1, which goes to the bottom right. It's individual pins uh, and they can be quite fiddly. So take your time and don't panic if you get them wrong. You can always go back and change these, but here's a diagram to help you get it right first time. And once you've done all of that, we're ready to go ahead and boot the PC up and check out performance. But first, let's see how good it looks in the only way we know how. Roll that montage. Looking fantastic! This Asus Dual 6650 XT is certainly a really nice looking card that fits well in our overall build aesthetic. And we've established that, but have we established that the performance levels are actually where we'd want them to be? Well, there's only one real way to find out. It's gaming benchmark time. On your screen now, it's a summary of all the results we gathered on this system from a wide range of titles. And we'll be comparing these results against other alternative GPU choices as we go through with graphs, gameplay, you name it, we're gonna try and cover it. At the first game we're going to look at more closely is GTA 5, an oldie, but it's a goldie. 
1080p high settings saw us achieve over 150 frames per second. The 6650 XT ranked fairly well against the competition, providing a nice margin over the RTX 3050, but falling some way short of the more expensive 3060 Ti. Note, I say more expensive, the MSRP prices are the same, but in real world market conditions, the 6650 XT is a good piece cheaper. In Battlefield 2042 next, here we achieved just shy of 100 frames per second at 1080p high. 97 FPS to be precise, in a game that visually looked really good. It was a similarly positive story in COD Vanguard, where next we tested out at 1080p high once again, this time using AMD's Fidelity FX Super Resolution, their DLSS rival, uh, at performance mode. We achieved just shy of 150 frames per second, where AMD's DLSS alternative really showed to be pretty competent. It was another good result in the likes of Forza Horizon 5, where in this title we pulled in 87 FPS on average at the 1080p Ultra preset. This is just a sliver more than what you'd find from a 3060, but providing the price is right, the 6650 XT is definitely worth considering. The story gets even better in Apex Legends, which is our next title, where at 1080p high settings we managed to achieve just shy of 175 frames per second on average. 173 to be precise, uh, with decent 90 and 99th percentile results show consistently high frame rates in a game that typically caps out at the 140-150 frames mark. Next up we also tested out a bit of Valorant, 1080p high settings this time around, and we got over 400 frames per second. Now don't get me wrong, Valorant is an easier game to run, but if you look at how it stacks up, Against its NVIDIA competition, the 6650 XT holds its own extraordinarily well. Fortnite was our next game today. Here at 1080p competitive settings, we once again saw some really decent results. 220 frames per second, which is a good chunk more than what we got on the 3060, and does fall short once again to the 60 Ti. Fortnite is a game where typically AMD are stronger than NVIDIA on the GPU front, just due to how the game's written and in-game optimizations. Finally, the last title on our list to look at is a bit of Warzone. At 1080p high settings here, we pulled in just shy of 100 FPS, 99 frames per second to be precise. 91 and 83 for the 90th and 99th percentile results rounded out a great sweep, and I was really impressed with the performance that we achieved here. And on that note, that pretty much wraps it up for this one. If you enjoyed it, make sure to drop a like rating, get subscribed, thanks for tuning in, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.